Yeah, and there's one of those tensions where like this is a thing we have to continually navigate, both at the level of problem selection, deciding what's going on in cases, but also at the level, I think Brian mentioned this, yeah, he's not here today, but he mentioned this yesterday, Brian Ray, um, thinking about like the extent to which judges' ideologies and judges' own reasoning plays a role in their evaluation, right? So, I mean, these are constant questions that we have to navigate and offer, but the, um, the important thing about Ethics Bowl, I think, is that done well, it's a it's a, a fertile ground for students to actually practice the process of like standing in democratically ideal relationships to each other, right? If you're looking for a way to kind of practice equality, right, in a way that isn't just presumed, isn't just um, sort of discursive, right, but actually requires you to listen carefully, negotiate with the person sitting across the table from you, ethics builds your place. Right. This is particularly powerful for students who do come from underrepresented backgrounds, but it's also particularly powerful for students who don't. Right. The, the skill of empathetic listening. Right. Putting yourself in another person's shoes, determining what's important to other people, even if it's not something you yourself have considered or built life around or anything like that is a core skill that um, I'll, I'll steal Bob Ladenson's words here. Um, that's pretty important if democracy is to flourish and maybe even survive. Um, I think Bob has recently sort of updated that line, uh, given some of the threats and conversations that we're, we're having. Um, but suffice it to say that, like, I think we're all in the room because we value these things, right, at least at a high level. Now, of course, what that means in terms of practice, right, what that means in terms of our, our coaching and our organizing and our, our judging um, is a sort of open question for us, right? Like how we interpret and apply these values are, are sort of important. So I wanna like throw things back to John, just having said a few kind of overarching things about the ways in which we're all kind of linking up here um, to give us some questions and some some navigation, I yeah. think, um, to start a conversation. John? Yeah, so I it seems to me that, at, you know, you wouldn't be here if you didn't, um, appreciate these values, right? So I think what, what we can talk about, uh, what I'm hoping to talk about today is, well, we could just toot our own horns and talk about all the ways we do great. I'd, I'd like to talk more about some challenges. Um, and I think there's really, I see sort of three things that can, can make living out these values so, um, a little bit difficult. One is in the attempt to get civ civility and um, collegial discussion, I've heard and seen people will say, you know, I, it's just all, it feels fake. It feels that, oh, thank you to the judges and thank you to the moderator and thank you to each and every living being who is here amongst us today. And, you know, and it gets people feel like it's all performative. So that's one that like, how do you avoid the performativity of civility in favor of real deep collegiality? The second is, Alex mentioned this natural tension between adversarialness and competitiveness, and how do we continue to walk that balance? Um, you know, how do we, you know, write rules or encourage certain behaviors that that knows how to navigate that line? And I think that the third, that's I think increasingly on people's radar, and it's a, a value that I don't know that we talked a lot about at the beginning of the Ethics Bowl's existence, but has become more and more important. It's part of why we have a diversity committee is this idea of being a welcoming and supporting a supportive space for all participants and potential participants. And there's a there is a tension there because if we take all seriously, that means that very, very conservative students should feel comfortable in that space and very, very liberal and progressive students should feel comfortable in that space. And that's not easy. Um, and so, I'd love to hear from you all about um, wherever you want to go, but maybe these three things. What are some of the ways that you try to make sure that, that you and your students are living out these values or you in whatever role you have? What are some ways you, you think we can continue to do that or do that better? And what are some challenges you see? So sort of those three themes would be what I'd love to have us discuss for the rest of the session. So what are you doing? What can we do better? And, and what do you think makes it difficult? And with that, we'll throw it open. And Larry, if I was laying odds, I had, I had you as the first hand up. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, I've had this experience. And one of the things I have to say I love about the Ethics Bowl is how easy it's been to navigate these things with the students who, who at least here, are attracted to the Ethics Bowl. Uh, they do this. They're not getting the most of my best students have not taken the course for credit. They've done it because they wanted to do ethics bowl and they had a full schedule. And uh, uh, this year I'm not even doing the class, uh, but I just find the students who come into ethics bowl are, are really uh, good in that way. Uh, maybe it's just the ones who like me and are recruited by me, but uh, that's a nice thing about it. And I think that's something positive we can say. I'm done. Yeah, great. Thanks, Larry. Okay, Joe. <laughs> oh, you're not muted. I don't think we, can, we can't hear you, Joe. I'm sorry. I have a separate mute button on my microphone in addition oh. to the, you have to the one two on the to microphone. navigate. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, it's a much fancier microphone than I probably need for this. But anyway. Um, so this relates to the the suggestion that I had yesterday about the unconferencing session about how to coach in in you know non philosophy context um, because what I've been thinking about lately is that what I really think I want to try to teach my students in this ethics bowl thing that I'm trying to launch isn't philosophy, but rather something like how to deliberate about the public good in a public context. And in most conversations people have with each other, that's not gonna look like people citing roles back and forth to each other, right? So what does it mean to teach students how to uh, have constructive dialogue? like? Uh, what does it mean to impart those particular skills? And, you know, one suggestion that I have here is uh, when I was at Appy and the Ethics Bowl uh, competition this year, you know, there was the booth from the folks at the Constructive Dialogue Institute. And, you know, there were other organizations who come and have booths at, at Appy. And I'm thinking to myself, how would it be if Ethics Bowl, you know, tried to develop some partnerships with organizations like that, you know, folks who are in this space of trying to teach students what it means to do public deliberation? Like, what if we tried to work with some organizations like that to, to develop some tools, develop some pedagogical resources for coaches who may not be trying to teach students anything about Rawls or Kant or Mill or anything like that, but are trying to teach students what it means to deliberate publicly about the public good. Like what, what partnerships can we develop with folks who are already trying to do that work who could help us develop those resources? Joe, I really appreciate it. And I kind of take it as a challenge and I'd like if people are willing to be a little courageous here, I'd love to hear because I, if, if you're like me, we might not be as good at it as we, we want to think we are, is how many of us actually spend time with our students talking about the values of the bowl as opposed to about the competition and about the cases um, and about all that stuff. I'd love to hear. So Ron put his hand up, which is awesome. And Michael, you already had your hand up. So We'll, uh, we'll get people in here. So, Mike, we'll go ahead. Yeah, I just I wanted to uh, follow up on what Joe was saying. Um, you know, there was a little bit of talk yesterday in the context of recruiting about, you know, maybe doing some kind of event on campus to sort of showcase how the ethics bowl works. Um, and I have had a couple of conversations at my institution with a colleague in our um, uh, applied communication or, or speech department um, who's involved with an organization called Braver Angels. Um, and that's exactly what they do. They work on this sort of like civil discourse and trying to bring uh, people from different uh, sides of, of the political spectrum together for conversations. Um, and we've talked about having, having um, some kind of events like that on campus um, that would be uh, 
I don't know, debates, but, you know, in a very sort of civil and collegial way and getting Ethics Bowl students involved with the students that are involved with her um, group. And and so I think that's a just a really fantastic idea to do more stuff like that. Great, thank you. Yeah, Kyle? Um, yeah, sure. So I spend like the first week of my class talking about these issues, the values and democratic deliberation. Um, somebody mentioned the book yesterday, Aiken and Talisa's book is one of the ones I use. So they have this book, um, I'm gonna forget the full, why we argue and how we should, um, that I use as a ground for talking about sort of democratic deliberation and why ethics bull might be different and why it might matter that you learn this style of argument. Um, I use my own article, which Alex kindly shouted out. And then uh, the other thing I use, and it's my colleagues here, and actually a former ethics bowler wrote a New York Times op-ed about um, ethics bowl versus debate. So I give a, I give the students those three sources. Awesome, fantastic, thank you, Alex. You your hand up a second ago, but then put it back down. I didn't know if you. I did. All right. So I, I am curious. I'm sort of re-asking that question. I know Ron said yes, and Kyle, and and. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing too, a lot of us also, the students themselves play a role in this. So I'm, I'm curious if you find that it's actually students passing on to other students, a lot of these values that, that you see that like, it's not, you're not actually having to do a lot of heavy lifting that the student, I'm always surprised that the students seem to naturally seem to get it when it comes to what the spirit of the ethics bowl is. And I think a lot of that is the way that they are all modeling for each other. So I, I'd love to hear about individual experiences. Yeah, Ron? Yeah, so um, our, we start earlier um, than many of you uh, in August. And so we've got some time before the cases come out. And so last year, what I did is I had veteran students who had been on it speak directly to this. I actually made, it was a class where they were taking it for credit. So I made that part of their assignment, you know, that they, they needed to dwell on this aspect of it and communicate it to the other students. Um, and then at the end of the semester, after the competitions were over, um, they had a finishing project project to write up about this subject and communicate that again back to the other students. And I think it really helped a lot. All right, there's always lag as I go to unmute myself to say, thank you, Ron, uh, but thanks, Ron, that was great. Alex, you keep putting it up and taking it back yeah, I Well, I, I just, I keep d debating on where is a good place to stick this in. I think, um, I mean, one of the things that I think is really, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about Joe's comment um, in particular, because the, in my context, the, the high school ethics bowls serve students who are never, at least in the majority of cases, never exposed to a philosophy class or a philosopher, right? So stressing the sort of broadly democratic values of the activity to high school students is, is really, really crucial. And I also think, I mean, I think at, at the IEB level, it's, in, it's something that's incumbent upon organizers too. Like when we're thinking about how to arrange our events, how to train our judges, right? Things like that. Right, like, are we emphasizing the sort of broader values questions, or are we emphasizing who's talking about Rawls? Right, are we emphasizing using Rawls's name, or are we emphasizing like the norms of public reason? Right, it always ought to be the latter. Right, and I think like this is another place where the the tension between sort of competitiveness and education comes up. Right, because I think like you know as I I noticed this between IEB regionals and IEB nationals. Right, as things get more competitive citation practices get more sophisticated, right? Um, and I think that that's not, that's not a mere regularity, right? Like, so there's, there's, there are places where that's rewarded. So I don't, and then this is not a criticism because the high school ethics bowl also has this issue, right? Increasingly, particularly as private and well-resourced public schools develop philosophy coursework and develop, um, you know, integrating, philosophical thinking in the traditional learn your big three moral theories way into other coursework, right? Um, that presents this kind of bifurcation whereby some students, you know, know the roles to cite and others don't, right? In IEB, like most people, because most IEB teams are outgrowths of philosophy departments, right? Most people, like perhaps frustratingly, are doing that for better or for worse, right? So I think it is an organizational issue 
to think about like at the level of design, like which value is it that we want to pursue, right? Is it roles for the sake of roles or is it roles for the sake of public reason? I keep using roles because I myself am a roles person, um, <laughs> but um, I'm translating, right? So I think, yeah, I'm thinking really hard about this because I don't think there's like an obvious answer. Um, and I don't think that, like I mentioned before, like I don't think keeping those, those sort of intention values like in constant alignment is like an easy thing to do. I don't pretend to have the answers to that, but I, I do think it's something that we ought to pay more attention to at a sort of organizational level, not just a sort of in the abstract level. All right, Larry, I'm gonna get you in one sec. I just, after Larry, just a note, uh, it, I feel like when these started to be on Zoom, I felt like 40 minutes took forever and Richard disagrees with me, but I feel like it flies by. So we have like 15 more minutes uh, in this session uh, scheduled. And so I just inviting you again to think about if anyone has specific thoughts about some of those, we're, we're talking sort of big picture about the challenges and the values, but if any of you have specific thoughts about some of these specific issues of like the performance of civility, uh, this tension with the competitiveness in this welcoming space issue, we could talk about some of those individually here too. But Larry, go ahead and then Marsha and then Sandy and then Kyle. There we go. Okay. Yeah, uh, this is uh, interesting to me because Rawls is my main interest and really my passion in philosophy. Uh, uh, I unabashedly am a thoroughgoing Rawlsian uh, of my own sort, like everyone is. But uh, uh, also what's interesting is that my teams typically come mostly from my philosophy 101 classes, and I have very few philosophy majors who get involved in this. Uh, um, but they know some philosophy from having had philosophy 101, and they know a bit of Rawls because I have my students read, I have them get the Kindle free sample, and they have to read the first four sections of a theory of justice, which Rawls notes in the preface as a summary of his whole view, and that's all you need. You don't need all that other stuff. You don't need to do the OP curve and all that for ethics full. Uh, you need a rudimentary understanding, and I might add that it really is important to know something about Rawls because when you're responding to other teams, you're going to hear Rawls, just like we are today. And, and so you want your team to be at least minimally prepared to respond to Rawls questions. And ditto for Kant and Mill and all that. And I really downplay the theory stuff. I mean, I every week I tell them it's not the philosophy bowl, it's not the you know ethical theories bowl. But uh, anyhow, uh, it works. It works fine for me. Uh, um, um, I would suggest trying to find non-philosophy. There are plenty of non-philosophy majors uh, um, who are into ethics bowl. And uh, to me, that's who it's mainly for is the student population in general. I'm done. You missed my great joke about Richard trying to start a fight, but Marsha, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I agree with what's been said, but one uh, practice or convention that I think works against our desire not to make this philosophy bowl or theory bowl is the increasingly common habit of teams to say, after you've presented a well-worked out argument with general principles, but you haven't name dropped, the other team will say, what's your moral framework? And that seems to just generate some stupid answer like, well, we're Kantians or we're utilitarians. And that seems to satisfy everybody. This strikes me as the worst possible kind of arrangement. So I don't know, maybe as coaches, we could all encourage our students to respond to the argument that was given rather than just asking this generic question, what's your moral framework, which is just no answer to that is going to be very enlightening. And I'm done. <laughs> okay. All right, Sandy. Good morning, everybody. Um, and it's so great to see everybody. Um, so I have, I'm kind of pivoting to use the phrase, which I don't really like, um, but to that welcome and supporting um, thing, because I've got a very interesting group of students right now who are not, who are more vocal about feeling safe or not feeling safe than any group I've ever had before. And I don't know if it's a feature of them or a feature of the time in which we live, maybe both. Um, and I don't know how, <clears throat> it has to do partly with um, 
where appy is happening and it also has to do partly with sometimes the cases themselves um and you know that we debate things about you know trans people for example they find like i can't believe you're arguing about my existence right and so having to try to i don't know how to negotiate that i mean i obviously i'm trying but i'm not sure i'm doing a particularly good job of it um in that you know everything's fair game but is everything fair game so that is kind of what i'm putting out there for our consideration Danny, I, I appreciate that. And I just, I want to just highlight it for a second, because it is something that we have been talking a lot about over the last few years, and especially as it comes to case writing. And if there's time, we could discuss this a little bit, because this has been debated. And I've had students too, or like, there is no legitimate other side of this, is that, is that student's view. And the fact that you're in telling us we need to talk as if there is, is unconscionable. Um, and you know, the, the retort obviously is like, well, there are many, many people on who are in fact on the other side of the issue. And so we ought to be able to think and, and reason with them. Uh, so I think this is one of the, the most fraught aspects of, of how we continue to live out our values, but also continue to expand them to be inclusive um, in a way that's really encouraging, right? Because people often, there's the flip side of this, right? Of people saying, I'm afraid, I have to watch what I say all the time now and how to balance that. Yeah, Kyle? Well, sure, I didn't have my hand up to respond to Sandy, but I, I was just gonna say like, one of the things I often say on this to students, I'm open to talking to them about it, of course, but I always pitch it as like, look, there's like a real political debate going on here. You may believe those millions of people have no position, but it's worthwhile to learn how to engage with them. Like if you want to be a democratic citizen and so try to help us talk about like the real dialogue that's happening in our country, no matter how offensive you find the other side. And I, I honestly, I increasingly feel like I have to make that pitch on a variety of topics. Um, so it's not like... Um, yeah, I feel like developing that kind of talk is important. I, I raised my hand to talk about the competition versus pedagogy and just share what I've done. Um, I, for quite a while, I've done this where I often just talk about that issue explicitly with my students. Like there will come a time when we're prepping and I'll be like, hey, this method you're doing, like why might that be bad for a democratic deliberator, but it might work at ethics bowl. <laughs> and I leave the students the choice. I'm like, look, you can decide as a team. Are you most interested in winning? Here's what might be the highest chance of winning, but why might that be a bad thing to do for our, like argument in general? And, and I leave them the choice. That's sort of throughout my pedagogy, I try to be as explicit with the students as I can be and let them choose. They're the ones who are competing, I'm not competing, right? So yeah, that's been my approach for a while. It probably comes from being a lawyer. I'd be like, hey, this might work. I think it's a bad tactic, but it might work. You know, that kind of approach. You, you know, it's, I see Joe and Eric, I'm going to get to you in one second. I just want to say two quick things. One about what's in the chat. Joe had posted something about uh, rules committee thing about saying, uh, can we just say certain types of questions are out of line? Uh, we are going to have a discussion of rules coming up later. And in addition to that being an update, that's exactly where we'll talk about some of these things. And it's, it'll be nice because we can have sort of this high level discussion about why we may or may not want to do some of that stuff. But the, the real quick thing I was going to say to Kyle, I really found your input really interesting because I struggle with that, this idea of leaving things up to the team when it comes to um, behavioral expectations. So if it's a tactic thing, I want to give it to them. But I know I remember taking a team once and was like, I know you guys want to go out and don't want to go to the final. I think we ought to go to the final. That's what it is to be a good sportsmanship team. And like, we'll go. Ultimately, I was like, if you're gonna, if we're gonna fight about it, I'll leave it up. But you know, I try to sometimes make my feelings pretty strongly felt to the team. Um, but then I struggle with that because the other side of that is like, I, I'm not, you know, they're not 12 year olds and I'm not their their parent, right? So. Yeah, Joe, and then Eric, and then Kyle, and then Michael, and that'll probably take us to the finish line. We'll You're muted, You're Joe. muted, Joe. Okay, uh, so this is in response to Sandy's question again, and I think the answer, and this is sort of a meta response, is that it might just 
partially depend on how confident we are that the values of the bowl will genuinely weed out all of the the viewpoints that we think truly are undeserving of consideration in a constructive civil democratic platform right that you know if if we think ethics bowl has these values then it by itself in virtue of those values just is going to exclude the views that ought to be excluded and i wonder whether the the question here is is primarily a question of how confident are we that that's actually true and i suspect that opinions on that might differ among those of us all right thank you joe now eric Oh, okay. Hi. Um, so I want to make a comment on at least two things that have been said. The first is about inclusivity. And um, I want to just point out that on our team, we often get students from different countries and students who practice different faiths. And so we'll have Christians on the team alongside people who are Hindu, alongside people who are Muslim. We've even had a student who was Baha'i on our team. So uh, for us, it's important to understand that different people coming from different religious backgrounds will have different takes on different issues. And here, I think one of the values of Ethics Bowl that we, prior, uh, that we prioritize is education. And it's sort of, um, it might be exclusive to some people learning if we say that some questions are off the table, no matter what the questions are, in part, what we do is teach them to participate in the ethics bowl competition, but also in part, what we do is, um, is reflective of the ethics bowl value of educating students on ethical issues, in which case we are gonna have to have them think about, research about, discuss some of the more complex issues that they will disagree with because of the different backgrounds that they come from. Now we're sure to tell students that they that they are, ought to practice the faith that they want to practice and, um, and think about the complex issues in the way that they want to think about them. But some of that thinking about the complex issues will entail that they learn uncomfortable material. And so we're upfront about that and we're straightforward about that. And I do think that if we were to take issues off of the table, we might undermine one of the values of the ethics bowl, um, which is education, especially educating young people who will have heard these issues at the age of 18, but now they're for the first time outside of their parents' household. And so now they're grappling with issues to try to think about what kind of people they wanna be independent of their parents in a context of a complex democracy with a lot of different faiths represented. So I just want to put that on the table for us to think about as we think more about this um, issue. And um, then the other thing I wanted to make a point about was teaching um, the material. Since Rawls has been the, the target, I'll stick with Rawls. It helps me help students think about these complex issues when I am able to give them people like Rawls or Plato and because we have students from other countries, we introduce um, Sun Tzu and other philosophers who aren't just Western thinkers. It helps me educate students when I'm able to do that. It also helps students learn the importance of what the philosophers were attempting to do when they're able to use it, when they learn to use it. So I, I agree that some students will be better at learning and using it than others. But we try to tell students, our students at least, that you want to talk to the audience that's before you. So you might be before a philosophically inclined audience. Imagine you have professors who are on the judging pool and they're all comfortable with these theories. So then it's OK to talk to them. But then you might have a, a group of uh, judges who none of whom have any familiarity with the philo philosophical material. In that case, you do want to bring your language the language that you use to the audience that you're speaking to and not make it sort of dripping in philosophy because right, they won't care about that. But I, I just wanna encourage us not to abandon the philosophical thinkers because they help us 
teach our students who are leaving their homes for the first time to think about some of these really difficult and complex issues that we ourselves don't even have answers for, but we're willing to engage in the practice of thinking and discussing them. So thanks for the floor. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Uh, this is, we're going to run over time, and that's fine because we have built-in breaks. So if any of you want to, you know, get up and go to the bathroom, get a cup of coffee, whatever, feel free. But we got some hands up, so if people are want to stick around, I'd love for us to just continue the conversation for a few more minutes. So, Kyle, take it away. Um, well, just really quick, I want to respond to you, John. Although I also wanted to say, Eric, I really agree with what you just said. Um, I don't know. I just to say, like trusting the students, um, I'm. It's not always perfect, but I'm overwhelmingly impressed by what happens when I trust them, and they yeah. almost universally pick the values and standing up for what they believe in rather than trying to win. For what it's worth, <laughs> um, like they are probably trying to win less than I would have, um, and they often <laughs> run these arguments that I think are beautiful and go over terribly with the judges. And I just like talk to them afterwards. So like that was awesome. I mean, I still remember uh, one case they did on the Rachel Dolezal. Remember that one? The, the yeah. transracialism. I had a team, and and, and I want to say that all respect to the judge volunteers, right? A team. Every single person on the team had a multiracial identity. They were from all over the world, and they gave this really subtle, thoughtful, and compassionate to Dolezal position. And three white judges tore them apart and said, "How could you think?" <laughs> And I was like, you lost the round, but that was one of the most beautiful things I've seen. I love you all. You know, it was that kind of a experience. Um, so it's been totally rewarding. And I want to speak in favor of trusting your kids as much as possible. I love that. Thanks, Kyle. Yeah, I agree. Sometimes I find with my daughter, I'm like, it's up to you. Do you want to be that person? <laughs> uh, Michael? Yeah, on this, on this same point of like, the the question of you know sticking to the values versus like trying to find tactics that win um i mean ideally right sticking to the values would be what wins right and i think that that is worth considering and sort of taking into account in our conversations about preparing teams about preparing judges um maybe even thinking about rules and things like that right to say you know to ask what can we do to support the values of the bowl such that the team that the teams that adhere most to the values in their arguments and their preparations do the best in the competitions right um and i you know sometimes we've talked a lot about like name dropping and citing um philosophical theories as one like sort of impressive maneuver but another thing that comes up a lot is like a, a team in a commentary, for instance, saying like, all right, well, here are our nine questions to you, and we're going to go through them as quickly as possible, right? Something that seems to me to go against the grain of the values of the ethics bowl, right, but can look really impressive in a competition. But I think that that's fairly easy to nip in the bud if when you're training judges, you say like, that's not what we're looking for <laughs> in, in commentary, right? And I... Um, I don't and know, that's I think actually that, sorry. I didn't mean to. Step oh no, go ahead. Up. Go ahead. I'll wrap up. I was just going to say, not only is that in the training, but it's in actually the language of the scoring guide. Uh, is uh, what what should you not be looking for? What should you be looking for? So, but I appreciate that. And a thing that we might come back to, or the rules committee might come back to at some point, as as Alex mentioned, the high school ethics bowl spirit points count towards your score, and they do not. And and. And, uh, you know, maybe we revisit that at some point. And, of course, that would involve fleshing out what we mean by spirit points, right? Um, but it's interesting. Larry, with apologies, I'm going to skip you so we can get some other voices into the conversation. Let me get Suzanne and then Matthew, and then if there's time, Larry, we'll, we'll come get you. Hi. Can you hear me very well? Okay. Um, you know, because I'm new to the ethics bowl, I, I, I couldn't say I know very well all of the values of the ethics bowl. Um, but are there circumstances where values of the ethics bowl could be in conflict with the values of students and participants? For example, when John just said if a student wanted to be that person, um, without knowing a lot, in most contexts, I tend to be myself. And then I do turn out to be that person. So I suppose when I witnessed the ethics bowl recently for the first time, I was, I, I saw, 
I saw some of the refinement that my professors wanted to see in me. <laughs> I wish I could be more like how these students presented themselves. And so I think of, you know, at very well, at very high levels of government, United Nations, et cetera. I mean, that's how they appear to talk. But, you know, in government circles like my own in the Caribbean, that's not how the leaders speak to each other. They, they're not, they're, you know, they're not so, what's the word? Let's say uh, up your bra. Not really, they just do what they have to do. So when John just said, do you want to be that person? I, I can't imagine going in. I mean, I'm too old now, but if I were a student again, and I'm coming from a debating background, but I feel a bit of, as we've had this conversation, I'm feeling a bit of, um, what's the word? I'm feeling a little bit of suppression because if I were a student, speaking only of myself, if I were a student at the ethics bowl, I, well, I mean, after years of training or whatever coaching, I suppose I'd get better at it. But there's certain topics that are so close to one's heart that I'm thinking it's hard to just come across so so genteelly, right? But the other thing I've been saying in my head is if, 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 if students are given the cases ahead of time, they sort of get to work through their feelings and their emotions and their reactions. So when they're actually on the stage, so to speak, they deliver in, a, in an appealing way, right? No, I cannot use the word appealing. I don't want to say we're, we're making any appeals, but you deliver in a way that would meet the values of the, what, of, of the, the ethics goal, not what the judges are looking for, because it would be quite hypocritical to be answering questions based on what you think judges are looking for, because there, there's an audience there who could be struggling with a particular issue and they'd like to see where people fall on the issue, but in a civil, I guess, way, right? What do you think? Sorry, Suzanne, I was just typing that we're going to just let this discussion run a little bit longer since it's such a good discussion. And we'll start the next session um, at like uh, 110 ish. So we'll still have a little break for people. Uh, Suzanne, I love your your comments because I think um, they really do make me return to that that question about and you posted something in the chat about civility in an in a, in a article that you came across about this idea, I had a colleague once that in a moment of, uh, I don't know, vitriol said, you're not teaching students to be ethical, you're teaching them to be lawyers. And it really cut, you know, this idea that like, you know, cool and calculated deliberation maybe is not actually real, it's, it, that's less real as, a, as, as um, ethical living. Um, I think there's room to push back on that, but I think it's an interesting thing for us to think about. Uh, these ideas about, you know, balancing, preparing for the real world with, with really living into our true selves, with trying to honor some of these collegial discussions uh, as part of our values and mission. Uh, so, yeah, I appreciate it. Matthew. Hi, yeah. Um, I just really wanted to echo what Michael said. And I think, you know, we, we kind of tend to think about um, winning and like upholding the values as two separate things. But I think like, when you're actually competing and maybe I can come in with like a unique experience because I'm both a coach and a competitor currently um when you align the values of like that you described uh that Appy tries to embody I think that's when you get the highest level discussion so kind of what what I try and teach like I'm I'm kind of in charge of um you know training a lot of new people and what I try and do is just emphasize that try and actually get really engaged with these issues and really care about them. And I think that's when, and you know, winning is sure it's nice, but it really is not important uh, like to us. Um, so what we really try and do is just emphasize that, hey, you know, really try and get engaged with these issues, really care about them. And you will do well in competitions in because you actually care about these issues and you're not just trying to employ some of these like tactics just to win. Um, and, you know, what we also try and really do is just emphasize that at the end of the day, this is like a conversation. So some of the tactics that teams might use that might make you sound, make you like look good in front of judges, but doesn't really help the discussion. We try and just um, 
I, I guess we're we're a little, we're a little bit stricter and try and basically just like say and like nip it in the bud and say like you can't do that and we we also like try and lead by example but yeah that's just I know that was a lot of thoughts but no it's awesome and it's it's so great to hear a student um, with that <laughs> Matthew I know you're a student coach but yeah uh, yeah Joe so this is primarily in response to Suzanne. Uh, I think part of the challenge here is trying to embody or infuse into the actual competition itself some sort of an acknowledgement that constructive dialogue or civil dialogue doesn't have to be dispassionate dialogue. Mm -hmm. You know, I was talking earlier about wanting to to you know, help my students think about questions of the public good without necessarily citing philosophers. And I'm thinking about, you know, I, I want to teach my students some James Baldwin. I want to teach my students some Ralph Ellison, right? And so part of that is like acknowledging that there are ethical arguments that are worth paying attention to outside of the philosophical canon, but also mm -hmm. that there are ethical appeals that are worth listening to or that, that, that are very much the opposite of dispassionate. And, you know, I think part of the challenge is that we all know from, you know, those of us who have coached before, you know, we've been in practices that when the conversation really gets impassioned, that's, you know, that's the really good stuff, right? But then somehow that all kind of gets filtered out of the competition. And so there's this disconnect between what we know is like the best parts of ethics bowl in terms of the conversations going on among our students and prepping for it, but then they still think or they still feel like there needs to be this removal from that when it comes time to sit down and have a conversation with five or six people across the table that they've never met before. Let me just respond. And I think both Matthew and Joe, John a little bit, but both Matthew and Joe really helped me to see the difference. It's really a dialogue that we're having, right? That's what the ethics vote is. You start a conversation, you can concur, you can disagree, but the conversation will go to a, 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 a an understandable end. It's not like you're gonna, you, you're, I don't wanna say piss somebody off. It's not like you're gonna piss somebody off and then walk off mid-conversation. No, that's not what you want. You start the conversation, I disagree, I agree, but there's another point. Is this that's 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 what you're trying to cultivate, right? Okay, I get it. Thank you. And actually, some uh the way that we kind of explain it is we kind of use just a philosophy to explain it. Like, what would the virtuous like ethics bowl competition look like or like round look like? And it is when you are really just being really respectful and um, you know, when you're respectful and I, I someone brought up like asking a bunch of questions um that's kind of like a tactic that people can use to kind of make maybe make the other team look bad but it's not going to lead to productive dialogue so that's what we re really try and hammer in is like okay what would the virtuous you know ethic bowl com ethics bowl competitor look like and they wouldn't do that so kind of like use that as a model but all right, thanks, Matthew. Jonathan, we're going to give you the second to last word, and I'm going to reserve to myself the last word because I'm a bully. Well, that, that sounds was... that sounds reasonable to me. So, um, I guess one thing that sort of you know came to my mind as as these last couple few comments were made was just this idea that maybe like it's okay that what the ethics bowl looks like in competition isn't really what we're going for. Like in some sense, the best product is the thing that happens and all the preparations getting to the moment that we end up presenting what we do. And I think in some ways we work out in our teams, like what arguments can be made and have good justification, which arguments can't be made or like um, not in insofar as like no one can make them, but like they're just not good arguments. And uh, so some of the learning in, in a way like it can't happen in the moment. Uh, it's got to happen like before the competition. And so setting up like the competition rules, not so much to like get the perfect product at the end, but rather to like produce the conversations that we want um, beforehand. So I guess I've always, I've always sort of wanted the competition to look like, yeah, ideal. <laughs> 
in a way and have these like great interactions between teams. But I think given the time constraints, it's really impossible. And where we have the most time in those practices, that's where like the good stuff kind of has to happen. Um, most of it will, will end up happening. Um, so that, that's just a thought that came to my mind. Actually, John, I actually, it's a, it's a terrific thought to end on because I'm not just saying that because it's going to be no matter what, um, because it is a really good reminder that it's not just the competition that we're all focusing on. It's the educational experience with the students, often for several months. And that's where so much of the profound growth and learning happens. So it's, it's a really, I'm really glad that, that, uh, that you said that. Um, for my last word, all I want to do is ask you all a question, and it's a simple thumbs up emoji question. We have some different breakout sessions scheduled for the last session, and we could add one more if there's interest in continuing the virtues and values conversation. So if you would be interested in um, having an extension of that conversation as an option uh, for the last session today, um, just give a quick thumbs up emoji um, and we, we can add that to our slate of offerings. Otherwise, I'm sure it'll come up in some of the already existing offerings. Um, we're gonna be talking already about coaching. Um, and so that's probably gonna be there too. Okay, so we'll let it just sort of happen organically at some of the other sessions then, awesome. All right, well, thanks everyone. Uh, we'll take 10 minute break and we will come back with uh, um, a discussion of organizing, uh, which Richard will lead. See you soon.